So as you can tell from that uh, uh, panel session title, uh, this is, uh, yes, the previous one was sort of a grown-up session, uh, but this one is for younger people session, uh, the current students. And uh, I, uh, I'm, I will be moderating this, this panel, but I'm planning to uh, open up the, yeah, at least the second half of this panel discussion to all of you that what you observe about uh, this, uh, you know, the student um, learning experiences for diverse backgrounds, you know, immigrant uh, uh, as well as refugee backgrounds. So uh, be prepared to participate if you could. Um, so, um, but I want to start the conversation by, yes, asking the all three panelists here to talk a little bit about uh, themselves, but also sort of um, their organization that they represent here. Uh, let's start with um, Harry, please. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Hari. Last name is Adikari. <laughs> Hari Adikari kind of rhymes, so um, <laughs> it's cool, right? Um, I go to Ohio State. Uh, I'm studying uh, business. I'm in. Uh, I'm studying finance in the Fisher College of Business. I actually um, came to the U.S. in 2008 as a refugee myself, and I'm from the Bhutanese Nepali community. I came to Tucson, uh, Arizona in 2008, lived there for about six years, and I'd, I moved to Columbus 2014. I waited for a year to go to Ohio State, and then now I'm there, you know, um, trying to hopefully we'll graduate in a couple of years or so. Um, so I represent BASO, which, is, which stands for Bhutanese American Student Organization. We are a very new student organization at Ohio State, and, uh, you know, uh, getting involved in the community has always been my passion. And I found that you know, student engagement at the college level is very important, especially for, for a new community like ourselves, you know, where we do not have uh, much leadership or much representation anywhere. And then I thought it would be a you know, great place for us to start there. We have about 20 students that, you know, go from, uh, that go to Ohio State from um, my community. And then we are slowly but you know, surely a uh, growing organization and always involved uh, with different community organizations. BNCC, uh, Sudarsan, who was in the panel earlier here, he's the executive director of the BNCC, the Bhutanese Bali Community Center. We are very involved with that, and uh, I personally work for an organization called CRIS. CRIS stands for Community Refugee and Immigration Services, and I actually am a Community Connectors Program Assistant for them. We run a mentorship program. And through Chris also, I'm very, you know, actively involved. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, yeah. Great. Uh, a quick um, <coughs> note. Unfortunately, that uh, Suad Osman, uh, the, the planned uh, guest panelist, uh, who represents uh, Somali Students Association of the Ohio State University, had a sort of family emergency last night, so she cannot make here. So that's why that discrepancy between this uh, program and the panelists here. Hello, I'm Danielle Kipiden. I am Cameroonian. Um, that's in West Africa. I moved to America 12 years ago. Well, no, 10 years ago. <laughs> and um, I first lived in Tucson, Arizona for <laughs> five years and uh, moved to Maryland um, where I lived for another five years. And um, now I'm here. Well, um, I'm the president of the African Student Association and uh, we are an association um, of Africans, African Americans, um, African enthusiasts, Afro Latinx um, students who uh, want to learn more about their heritage, their cultures, and how um, our different intersectionalities um, work together. Um, right now, we're working on, we, we work in our community to educate on the Denison population, whoever wants to come to our events, about um, African cultures. We work with our Columbus community last year um, with the Mauritanian um, abolitionist group so they can educate us about, um, about slavery in Mauritania um, right now with uh, the Muslim Student Association and Amnesty International. We're actually working to um, do a fundraising um, event to give some funds to Chris <laughs> um, for to give to Syrian and Somali refugees, and also next, um, right now we're also working to fundraise some money for Hurricane Matthew relief. So we we kind of work to try to help our our most um, 
our community right here at school, our community in Columbus, and our community abroad. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Trixie Cortez. I'm a junior studying sociology anthropology. Um, I'm Filipino, and my family and I moved here in 2006, so it's been 10 years now. I am currently the president of the Asian American Association, and we're an org on campus that was created for the safe space of like so that caters to the social, cultural, political, and educational needs of the Asian community on campus. Um, like Danielle said, like it's not just for Asians; it's for everyone that wants to learn more about um, our culture and the community and. Um, we consider anyone that goes to our meetings an ally, so everyone's welcome to go. Um, yeah. Great. Um, yeah, so the previous panel discussed that, that the primarily about this primary and secondary education issues and, and, and the promises, if you will, of those uh, uh, immigrant and refugee communities. So tell us a little bit about your personal you know, journeys, if you will, to the current higher education institution that Denison on Ohio State you know, university. So, for example, like, uh, when did you start thinking about going to college? What are the sort of influences in your life to come to, uh, you know, to get the higher education in general, but also um, this particular institution, Denison and Ohio State University? So, tell us a little bit about your personal journey to where you are today. I guess I'll get started on this one too. Um, so. My motivation to go to college, uh, I mean, I, uh, so I'll tell you about a little bit about uh, my journey in the camp, in the refugee camp. So the refugee camp, we had seven refugee camps in eastern Nepal. And then, uh, as Sudarshan mentioned, the context, the, the real, the, how we ended up in the refugee camp really had nothing to do with any kind of like a war crisis or anything that's going on in the Middle East. Ours was purely a case of ethnic cleansing. The government did not like us practice our culture, our values. They didn't want us there. They just used, uh, they even uh, employed some military power. With the, with the help of Indian government, they chased the, um, the Nepali-speaking southern Bhutanese from uh, Bhutan as early as the 1989s and the early 1990s. So that's how we really ended up in the camp. And in the refugee camp, the situations are really bad. You know, you don't have a concrete system of, uh, in place for health or b education or any kind of social support for that matter. So, you know, growing up in refugee camp, we definitely struggled a lot, you know, um, just even like, who, who, who am I? Like, I had that question in my mind, who am I, where do I belong to? You don't really have any kind of identity, you know, living as a refugee. You go anywhere and you have to say, I'm a refugee, and you get turned down just for being refugee. So it was very difficult. And then um, the opportunity to come to the U.S. basically came about in 2007 or so, when after rounds and rounds of bilateral talks between the government of Nepal and Bhutan, nothing, like people wanted to go back to Bhutan, but it was not obviously happening. Uh, two governments were having you know, so many rounds of conversation, and, but no result. So people started getting frustrated, and, and my dad was one of the very first ones who, were, who was like, well, maybe we should think about, you know, even going somewhere else. Because living in Nepal, there's nothing for us. And for me, honestly, I was, I was in um, 11th grade, when, you know, when this uh, thing came. And I said, yeah, I mean, I want to go to college. I want to do something with my life. I'm not just going to, you know, be in the refugee camp and I have to lie to people about my identity. And, you know, why a life is not living, uh, you know, worth living and if you have to lie at every step that, you know, you have to go and, like, face people. So, you know, just a huge amount of pressure, you know, to my uh, parents. And they obviously wanted for us to, you know, have the, the best education and all that. And, you know, as Sudarshan mentioned earlier, that uh, seven countries came forward and said, we will take chunks of refugees to our countries, you know. And U.S., you know, um, we always loved the U.S. I don't know why. I was a very little, you know, I was, when I was little, we used to watch uh, the Olympics. And then the U.S. used to have the highest medal counts, <laughs> pretty much all the Olympics. <laughs> I guess, you know, I, I mean, I just liked it because of that. But again, that was, uh, there, was, there was no particular reason back then. And later on, when, we, when this was like a real conversation, my dad said, we are going to the U.S. And then I started looking into it. And that got me very excited, you know. So that's how we ended up in Tucson. And Tucson was a random, like, we, we didn't pick Tucson. So when we, when we were brought to Tucson, it was like a huge, uh, like, w 
what is this place? You know, like this is <laughs> we're, we're in the middle of nowhere. This is a desert, you know, like the, the, the entire thing was different. We lived in a different kind of uh, uh, weather condition in Nepal, you know, and then you are brought in Tucson and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> You know, so that basically was our situation. Anyways, uh, I guess um, it, it definitely, I think, you know, now I, I look back, definitely was the best choice we could have, you know, made, uh, my family made for us, my, you know, my brother, my sister, and myself. And I'm really happy to be here. Um, so for, you know, going to college, obviously, as I mentioned, in the, even in the camp, I wanted to go to college. But obviously, that was not going to be uh, possible, living in a refugee camp. And um, here I am. I uh, started uh, as a senior in high school in Tucson. So I just went to high school for about nine months or so. And then uh, for me, it was a little different uh, situation. We actually saw the organization that brought us, you know, there's a re refugee resettlement agencies in all the cities that the refugees are taken to. Basically, the case manager goes to the airport to receive you. And then from receiving you um, at the airport, they try to take you to your apartment. And they also try to help you navigate some services. So our social worker, um, um, she tried to help us. But again, you know, they have a lot of families. They have a lot of caseload. So she could not do a whole lot. So we had to do it on our own. And um, in Tucson, we did not have many families, you know. We were one of the very first families to be settled in Tucson. And um, my dad, he just, we took a bus uh, one day and we saw a high school and he just, said like, how do we, you know, how do we go about getting my kids admitted here? So me and my brother, we went there, we were the, uh, we were the only Nepali speaking kids, you know, <laughs> at Tucson High School, um, that's the name of my high school. And I went there for about nine months, did not know anything about the American education system. So that is one of the big challenges for immigrants that come here. The, to navigate the education system in America, it's very, very difficult. You have so many things going on uh, you like you don't know you know what kind of opportunities are there. I mean, I I was a very hardworking student. I did very good until like you know like 11th grade or so, which I got to do before I moved here. But I was kind of lost, you know, in the, in 12th grade. So I was I was a senior at Tucson High, and then I had to take all these courses. Not really complaining about it, you know uh, the material itself, but just like being in so many courses and not having proper support you know, system, um, yeah, so those were all the challenges that we faced. And uh, I didn't know anything about the scholarship. I took like two AP classes. I didn't really know what AP meant, but they said like they were, the, they were a little tough. So I, you know, always like to challenge myself. That's the only reason I took AP. Did not know if you took all APs and, you know, passed your ACE to your AP exams, you would get scholarship, I did not know that. So I, you know, settled for going to community college. My brother, who got to go for a couple of years, he actually ended up going to University of Arizona, you know, uh, to study as an undergrad. So that's, that's really my journey. I mean, you don't really know a whole lot. You know, this country has so many things. It's uh, administrative things, you know, that you, are, you really are not uh, be able to figure out easily. It'll, it'll take time, so. Um, well, before I start my journey, I kind of wanted to comment on, since I also did high school, I did middle school and uh, half of my high school career in, in Tucson, Arizona. Um, I remember uh, going, and one of the first days of class, they would take, because Cameroon is a bilingual country. We speak French and English. So I come here already with kind of an English background, and um, people doubting my English because, like, it doesn't sound American. So I'm in, like, the remedial ESL classes when I'm supposed to be in, like, the, like, the highest level ESL. So that's also one thing that, like, that was really frustrating. Like, I'm sitting in a class, and I have to learn, like, the alphabet. And I'm sitting here, like, I speak English. I know English. My accent is not as good as yours or as American as yours. But there was also that struggle of, like, having to, to prove your intelligence because your accent doesn't show it. But um, so my experience was um, vastly different. Um, my, I actually came to the United States because of my mother. She was a PhD um, scholar. She got a scholarship to go to Tucson, um, the University of Arizona in Tucson, and that's why we came here. So I went to middle school, half of high school, and then she, when she finished her PhD, um, she got a job at American University in DC. So we lived in the suburbs of Maryland, and um, she tried her hardest to always, like, to have us live in a place where I would be have the access to a really great school system because the one in Arizona was not as great. 
And I remember it was really challenging having to switch from like a really poor educational system to a really great one in Maryland. But um, afterwards, after graduating high school, um, I remember feeling incredibly lost. Everyone um, knew what they wanted to do. Everyone had already done all these scholarships, all these uh, internships and in these different jobs. So they kind of had an idea of what they wanted to major in. And um, I didn't. So I took a gap semester. Then I went to community college for two and a half years. And then uh, during that time, my mother got a job here at Denison. And then after two years, I decided to apply to Denison. And I got in. And that's why I am here. So it's a little um, different. I'm kind of here because my mom, for her education, was always the most important. Her dad was an instructor in a primary school. So for him, also, education was the most important. So in her household, education was always the way. So for me, it was never like a question of choice. Like educate, like I had to go to college. There was no other, no other option. Hello. Okay. Great. Um, going off of what Danielle said, um, my family was very fortunate enough to come to America based off of opportunity. Uh, we moved here because my mom got a job in Chicago. And um, that's when she decided that she wanted to move our entire family to America just so there were better opportunities here for us and um, my three brothers. One of them's actually in the audience right now. Um, <laughs> so uh, like Danielle said, edu or going to college was never um, an option, like a yes or no. Like it was always yes, we you are going to college because that is why we moved here. And um, when I was in high school, it was always a very, it was a very different experience. experience. So, well, it started off in middle school when um, I came to fifth grade and people would ask me, oh, like, you're, oh, you just moved here. Like, how is your English so good? And I had to explain to them, well, I've been speaking English since I was born. Um, you know, like they speak English in other parts of the world. Um, and that, it was sort of like a weird experience because people even though like I did speak English well and you know I adapted to the American culture like quickly I was still seen as like the immigrant girl and honestly like I was fine with that but you know like when I went to high school it like continued and even now in college like people still question um or are curious about the fact that I am an immigrant and you know I've been here for 10 years and I am a legal resident of this country but I am not a citizen um, and people ask, oh, how could that be? So does that mean you're an international student? Like, does this mean that? Does this mean that? And, like, it um, – sometimes, like, I feel like that's a barrier because people uh, – they have, like, this certain notion of, like, what I can do and what I can't do just because I'm, like, an immigrant. Um, but my parents, they would always tell me that – um, when I was like struggling in high school, like even struggling now, they would always just encourage me to keep going because a degree coming from an, an accredited American university is s worth so much more than a degree coming from like a Philippine university. And even though that sucks to say because like Philippine universities are great, like it, um, there's this notion that like American universities are so much better. And that's why like they keep pushing us, they keep pushing me and my brothers to like finish college and like get our degree here and then and then we can go back to the Philippines and like get a job there and say like hey like here like here is me with my American degree like I worked hard to get to where I am and like to graduate college and um just like push through like all of the struggles that like everybody else went through um but yeah pretty much like there it wasn't it wasn't like oh like I can I can, after high school, I can just, like, go straight and take a job. Like, no. Like, my parents, um, it it wasn't, like, I could just, like, do that. It had to be, like, I had to go to college. And, like, I remember applying for colleges and thinking, like, I don't know where, I like, I would want to go. Like, I didn't even know what I wanted to study. I came to Denison as a political science and studio art double major. Now I'm just sociology, anthropology major with a studio art minor. So, like, it's changed throughout um, and that's okay, but to my parents, like, as long as I, you know, get my degree and I grow as a person um, and as a student, like, everything will be good. So that's my personal journey. So. Great. Thank you. Yeah, let's just expand a little bit of your personal experience to this, you know, um, larger group of immigrant or, and refugee uh, backgrounds. 
that uh, organizations which you represent here. Um, do you think there are like sp specific challenges you, you know, and your uh, other members of the organizations you represent here as a young person, young people from the immigrant or refugee background, whether it's a first generation, 1.5 generation, second generation background, that the school administration or you know, your peers of non-immigrant background, non-refugee background, just hard time understanding. Is there anything that you find this gap, void that you experience, observe yourself or your, you know, your group members? Um, thank you. It's a, it's a really good question, and um, it's it's a question that you know I can actually answer just you know from my experience, my personal experience, and uh, the experiences of the my you know colleagues at BSO at Ohio State. Actually, I want to give a side, shout out to my friend who is actually he's the member of BSO. He's here with me. His name is Prakash. Give a Prakash. <laughs> Wave your hands. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I had to do it. Um, so you know the. One of the biggest challenges that I see uh, for immigrants, especially like uh, for kids, you know, from the the Bhutanese Nepali community, is um, educate. I guess like the the context of how they ended up here, and then the fact that y your school does not really have, uh, I guess, uh, a, a, a system in place that is um, there to help them make the college navigation easier, you know? So a lot of the, I worked at Northland High School, it's one of the, um, it's part of uh, Columbus City Schools, and I worked there as a bilingual assistant for about a year. And uh, when I was, uh, you know, working there, I saw many, many high school students that want to go to college, but they have no idea, you know, how to uh, go about that. Or I asked them, so what, I what it is about college that like, uh, that you need to know or what, you know, they were like, the colleges, um, you know, when they do the, I guess, recruitments, sometimes they go to like different high schools. I guess they don't really uh, focus on the, you know, they don't really take care of the students that are from other communities. And that's not being properly, at, you know, addressed. Um, another thing um, is obviously the, the language barrier, you know, you have so many tests and, um, uh, the burden of going to college, you know, like some, as Sudarshan said, uh, and even Dr. Subedi earlier in the panel, he discussed how a 12-year-old girl was basically taking care of the family, you know, and you have that situation. Many guys, they uh, they have, you know, a very, um, like, a strong desire to go to college right after high school, but they can't do it just because they have to support the family, you know. Um, where is my family going to be if I go to college, you know? If I go to college, if I become a full-time student, what's gonna happen to me, my family, my little brothers? Are they gonna be able to, you know, uh, have uh, food in the plates, you know, for dinner? So they have to worry about various things. And then, you know, you have the, the big financial burden and you have the, you know, the, the burden of the, you know, um, uh, like your, yourself, like, uh, how do you, how do I support myself? You know, I'm the only one that's working, and then so many people are just like um, frustrated because of that, and they just, although they want to go to college, you know, it's not really a reality. And so many of my friends, my personal friends that came to the U.S. after me, I know uh, now I'm you know at Ohio State, but a lot of them are like uh, married, they have kids, and working 60, 70 hours a week just to support the family. And they have no alternative, you know, they just can't go to college. Uh, um, that, and another thing is um, the, the financial burden, like, uh, you know, accessing like scholarships and things like that, you know. They are not really aware of the fact that there, there are opportunities for them to grab, you know, like financial aid, even uh, like the, like filling out FAFSA. If, you know, you have a very new family that just came here and the, the person is ready to go to college in about a couple years or so. They may not know FAFSA exists, you know, what FAFSA is. Even like, um, uh, you know, it sounds very simple, just, you know, go and go to fafsa.ed.gov and fill it out. But, you know, that's a very big thing for them. Like, they would not know how to do it. And uh, just, you know, just the challenges of um, having scholarship and being minority, you have the, the language barrier, and some families are, some family like for, like, let's say for my cousins, if they want to go to college, 
I can provide that information because I go to college, right? And then that's not true for all, everybody. That, you know, you have a big community, and um, that's why, like, our organization, our mission statement is that we advocate for higher education. We really work with high school students. Last year, we started the mentorship program uh, to work with uh, high schoolers that want to go to college, but some have, you know, that uh, they're not really sure whether they should go to college or not because they have to support the family. And others are in the dilemma where it's like the family problem is not such a big problem, but there's other issues, you know, that's plaguing them, right? So our organization started that mentoring initiative to work with them and just even help them pass the Ohio graduation test, you know, which obviously is uh, a state-based, you know, test that you have to pass to uh, go to college. So, you know, there's, uh, there's obviously lots of challenges, but um, I guess, uh, you know, like school systems uh, focusing, like, and Denison's or Ohio State, you know, those places, those big universities kind of focusing on the minority or the immigrant communities, you know, when they do their recruitments or, you know, just even giving information about how you go to Ohio State. So just e explaining the students that would, um, I think, make the process uh, smoother and easier for a lot of the people. Um, um, I, I have, like, two... I guess two little responses to that question. I think one is for, um, like Trixie said, like we're in this like limbo where we are residents here, but we're not citizens, but we're still considered like international, like I'm still considered a national student, which is, it's kind of weird because I've been here for 10 years. So a lot of things I do know, and then I, I still sit in like international student orientations and a lot of these things, I'm well versed in like the American system but because of that, it's like there's some opportunities that I feel I would really benefit from and some programs that I feel honestly would benefit from me applying to them. But um, it's not available to people who are like non, who are not citizens. But but I have been here for a while. But um, so that's that's kind of one thing. And then another thing, which is kind of small, but I think it's really important. I've I know I've spoken to a few people, and I know in my experience also that kind of um, we're lucky here at Denison. We have uh, free counseling services um, available to us at Whistler at our health center, but um, it's kind of hard sometimes for people who are like who are international students or who are like immigrants because they feel like the counselors might not understand their perspectives. Because I do know I remember one counseling session, and although like. Um, I understand that we are both, we're learning from each other and not everyone knows, like we don't all know everything, but I think there's some basis about like, like visas and immigration things that should be kind of known. And I remember spending like half of the session, like having to explain that. And that was kind of a half of the session that I could have done something else. Um, so these little things like that, like um, it makes it, it, it seems very small, but it makes it, it makes it so that like people in my condition or people who are freshly new here, they don't feel maybe as comfortable going, having access to these counseling services, which are amazing, but they don't feel as comfortable reaching out to those because they don't feel like they will be necessarily understood. Um, coming to Denison, I was very, or I think I was really fortunate enough to go through one of the orientation programs that we have here, and it's called Paving the Way. Um, it's geared towards, uh, I think, like multiracial students coming from big cities. Um, or just cities around the country, and they're coming here to just try to get the sense of like what it, what it's like to be around the Denison community. And going through that pre-orientation, um, I learned a lot about like how uh, like Denison as a community runs and what it's like to be here. Um, and I think there are like many other opportunities for students to go through programs like that. And I know for our international students, we have the international student. Um, or actually now it's called the students coming from abroad orientation, um, which I think is very helpful for them just because um, Marilyn Andrews, the, um, she's the coordinator. She, they are, the students are taught like what, you know, how to, how to get a job on campus and how like to apply, how to like renew their visas and how to make sure that like everything is good like on the, like the governmental side. I don't know if like that's the proper term, but um, just to make sure that like everything's squared away, especially for um, international students or like it, um, s like new new immigrant students. So I think that's really helpful, and that's one thing that um, I would like like to keep around for Denison. 
And personally, I've worked on our like or orientation staff for the past two years, and it's the um, August orientation that's required for most stu for not most students for all incoming students. Um, and I would like um, I would like for that program to have something about like how to like incorporate like international students or like um, how to like somehow like incorporate like immigrant students into that program because I feel like with that orientation program we just assume that everyone knows how to get by like in America and like we don't we recognize the fact that there are international students or like students coming from abroad but when it comes to like the main orientation we kind of disregard that fact and just expect everyone to um, like act like they've been here for a while so I think that's something that I would change for Denison or like something that like administrators um, can change like some sometime along this year great um, thank you so much so we have uh, 15 minutes left, so I want to open up that discussion to the entire floor. But uh, I want to have uh, like one sort of guideline question, if you, if you allow me to do so. Um, I'm sure that the Allegheny, Kenyan, Denison as well, there are those chatters, I guess, among some students, that those sort of uh, uh, ethnic, national, identity-based, if you will, organizations are, you know, that's supposed to provide safe spaces for the groups, and help them navigate the college experiences. I'm sure that you hear that some chatters that those organizations are counterproductive. They are sort of segregating. They are preventing those students from fully integrating to college, you know, campus experiences. I'm here. You, I'm sure you have heard those, you know, comments here and there, you know, explicitly or not. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm just gonna, you know, throw out that question to, to go, what are the values of those organizations, uh, like Basel, like a a AAA or ASA or SSA at the OSU, to, you know, to facilitate um, this kind of processes of dialogues. So, but that's not just, you know, my question, um, but uh, to the panelists, but to the all of you. So, if you have any, you know, takes on that, uh, um, not just the comments, uh, the statements made by the panelists, but also this big, you know, the questions that's hanging around on college campuses around the country. I would appreciate it. So, but not just limited to that. Any comments, questions to the panelists? Hi. Um, I think Denison has um, recently been really big on integrating our liberal arts education to how we can um, use it to the outside world because a lot of people outside think that um, we can't do anything with a liberal arts education, anything technical. And I think a big part of it is our student-run organizations. And um, I think one thing that would be great for us to do is having teachers who teach topics on our cultures, topics on um, what we're talking about at our organizational meetings would be like really beneficial on how we connect those dots to the outside world. Um, can I answer? I'm sorry. Um, I just want to jump in and answer that question um, because like in just talking about my own experience, when I first moved, I was a transfer student because I had gone to community college. Um, I was a transfer student last year. And um, that was my first year here at Denison, and it was incredibly hard, like just transitioning from like the suburbs of DC to <laughs> Granville, Ohio. And um, it was, but not just that; it was just just the school system and just the pace of Denison, and just um, coming from a vastly diverse place to coming here, which is diverse for Granville, but <laughs> not what I'm used to. Um, so it, there was a lot of factors um, that, that made tr transferring to Denison really, really hard. And that was a really tough year. And one of the things that made that year incredibly amazing was joining ASA and finding a space in ASA and calling ASA a home. And, and that, finding those people who were similar backgrounds as me, or maybe different backgrounds, but found commonalities in the African experience, and finding and making friends there and having that kind of home base gave me such confidence to the point that when the past president like was like, hey, Danielle, do you want to run for president? I hesitated, but I was like, sure. I felt so much more confident in my classes, just owning my space, just speaking up and just being myself because 
I felt like I had a home base on campus. So these home bases, they're not, it's really important I think for us to have our spaces where we can be with, like, with our people and then grow our confidence because we end up taking that energy out and making some changes around our campus, around our commu communities and around our world. I just wanted to comment on that um, from my own you know, organization. Uh, the Bhutanese American Student Organization is the first organization of any Bhutanese American students at the university level. So you know, we basically are the first student org all across the country and then um, we took this initiative because uh, as he said that you know, it's uh, important to integrate uh, your community members into the, the bigger world, right? And as a student organization at Ohio State, we are also receptive of all um, student, any uh, of any race or any ethnicity people can be members of our organizations, and we actually really appreciate that because, you know, it makes us um, happy that people are wanting to know about us, you know, our community and our culture. And, uh, you know, that's why, like, uh, we I've been I've known Dr. Suzuki for about uh, six months or so, and then the collaboration has just grown, you know, so much that I think uh, one of his classes actually are working with the members of my organization for one of the projects, you know. So we are always looking to uh, looking for ways to collaborate and grow, you know, as an organization. We want to be as involved as we can, and um, BASO's primary goal, you know, advocation, you know, adv um, to advocate for higher education as well as, you know. As a community-based organization, we also advocate for social justice issues. You know, what are the things that are impacting our community, and how do we go about, you know, solving those issues? And um, you know, without collaboration with other communities, I just don't see, you know, any solutions, you know, to the to the problem. Just us um, Bhutanese students cannot, you know, do a whole lot. So definitely, the collaboration piece is very, very important. I just wanted to, you know, throw that out there. Yeah, I agree with um, Hari because. I think for at least my org, what keeps us running is uh, collaborations. Collaborations and support from the community is key. Um, I've heard from a lot of students, especially first year students, like, oh, like you're president of AAA. Like, well, I'm not Asian or like I'm not American. Like, can I still join? And I always tell them, like, just because like that's our title doesn't mean that you have to fit in either of those categories to be a part of our organization. As long as like you support us and you, you know, still want to learn more about our culture and want to learn about like what we do and how we do stuff on campus, like that's perfectly okay. I know like in the past years, AAA has collaborated with multiple um, Greek orgs on campus and we've collaborated with Outlook, which is our um, LGBTQ uh, plus ally group on campus. And just, you know, breaking, not like, when I mean collaborations, I don't just mean like collaborations among like cultural groups like ASA or like um, collaborating with La Forza Latina, like it's, it doesn't have to stop there. Like it could, be, like I said, like it could, you know, go into Greek orgs, and it could go on into like other orgs that just push for like social, cultural, and like political issues on campus. Um, and I, I just feel like I, at Denison, like we're a really small campus, and I feel like people always like have to restrict themselves to smaller groups, and that's not the case. Because um, I like, for example, for me, like I'm a part of like several different orgs on campus that you know like have nothing to do with each other and what I want to push for is for them to like work with each other just so like we have that like stronger community on campus. Hi, hi, I hate mics. Um, <coughs> just like speaking to that question because um, I've been hearing a lot of discourse and framework around the idea that multicultural organizations are um, inherently I guess like what one would call like like reverse racism I guess is what it's what they're what, what, the, what, the, what the discourses are using around it um I think going off of what Hari said and what as, as well as what Danielle was saying just about that comfort that they feel and the ability to organize around these organizations I think that is w exactly why it's necessary um to say that a multicultural organization is breaking someone off into groups you first have to realize that these groups are already broke off anyway like in our society we view these people as being less than we view ourselves as being less than hence why we call ourselves minorities um, when we are the majority on this planet. Um, I think that our spaces are made so that we can create a playing field in which we can hear our voices and open up and not feel like we need to adhere to any type of Eurocentric standards, any type of standards that won't let us organize or won't let us mobilize. Um, 
I think I just want to speak about that just because I think that we need to be very wary, especially in our current political climate, especially in our, our current time, that people will try to disenfranchise even more. I think that we need to realize that we have we've always been this disenfranchised. Um, because I'm, I'm, I'm on the exec board of, with, of ASA with Danielle, and as an African-American man, um, there are many times when I have to uphold my community to understanding that I'm a, as a queer person, we can't do this, and we have to do better, because we know how it feels to be in that position. And I think that, um, it's so, that there's so much in that, and there's so much power in that, because then we're, moving, we're, we're transcending ourselves, we're transgressing ourselves. So I can speak on that. Hello, um, so my question is not going to be as, or my speech is not going to be as beautifully prosed as Brandon's, but <laughs> um, I think there's something that I've noticed just being an immigrant myself and a refugee myself is that I've kind of related a lot with that immigrant identity across like different backgrounds rather than just my own like Afghan identity. I mean, growing up as an Afghan refugee, I mean, I came here when I was three, I've identified and I've learned and I've grown that I can relate and connect with people who have shared that similar experience with me regardless of their national origin. And I think that's something that has to be said about these organizations on campus. They provide a platform to connect our intersectional identities, which is amazing and great. And I think that they're a progression rather than like taken away from it. So yeah. Um, I was just wondering, um, given the experiences you guys have had, uh, what advice you might give to someone who's um, coming to America for the first time, either as an immigrant or who's maybe just been recently resettled, um, who is maybe struggling with their self-identity and trying to figure out what they want to do with their life? Um, one thing that I think is incredibly important, and that's like the first thing that popped in my head when you um, started talking was um, like learning your history. We don't, we're not taught to do that. I, I know in my country, we're not really taught to do that. We learn a lot about the other than more than ourselves. And I think also like here at Denison, we have really um, awesome classes, which is like one of the reasons why I applied as well. But I would like us, uh, before I graduate, I would love it to see like an African studies program. That'd be so cool. But I'm saying, like, like, le like, as an immigrant, I think learning your history is really, really important. Understanding where you come from, because I find a lot of comfort in, like, in like the stories of my the, my past and the stories of like the heroes of my past and like the women who helped like my country shape my country and like those stories like they kind of fuel you and they kind of like help you shape who you are. And then with that, I think like with the strength of my ancestors, <laughs> then I can like move forward and then be stronger. I think learning our history is incredibly, incredibly important. And it should be, um, it should be encouraged way more than it is right now. Yeah, um, I agree with Danielle. I know when I came here, um, so I, like I said, I was 10 years, 10 years old when I came here and my parents like still reinforce the fact that we are Filipino immigrants. And um, I, you know, kept in touch with like my my roots and like my history and like I watched like videos and like what it meant to like be Filipino and like my parents would bring home like newspapers in Tagalog and like I would try to read them just so like I don't lose um, that connection with where I'm from and I I know sometimes that I struggle with like the idea of like being American because like like I said like I'm not a citizen but um, soon enough uh, actually, like in the next two weeks, like I will be going through like the naturalization process to be a citizen, and I know that that's going to be hard for me because like even now when people assume that I'm American, I immediately correct them like, no, I'm Filipino, like I'm an immigrant, like I moved here, like I am not, you know, I'm not from here, and I'm proud of that fact, like I because there's so much history that comes from that, like I. You know, like my parents like really pushed and worked hard for us to be here and I'll never be ashamed of that. So it's just like Danielle said, like learning about like where you're from and like reinforcing that is like a key to like accepting like who you are. And like, like I said, since I'm going to go through like this process, like I honestly don't know what I'm going to do because like at, you know, like I don't know if you guys know, but like to be a citizen of this country, like to be naturalized, like you, the last thing for you to do is, um, to basically like sign and say an oath that 
that's saying that like you will be loyal to um, no other country but America. And I, I don't know what I'm going to do when it comes to that, but um, I'll let you guys know. But for now, <laughs> um, I am very proud of the fact that I'm a Filipino immigrant. And even though that I've been here 10, 10 years, like I'll never like I'll never let that go. Yeah, just kind of wanted to uh, you know add to what these uh, two said. Very very important thing. You know, you take uh, wherever you go, you you take your personal story with you. Stories are very very powerful way to connect with new people. You know, or any people that you meet. Do not forget your identity. You know, I always say when I uh, talk to you know uh, students that are in high school, like do not forget that you are. Uh, you know your your parents were Bhutanese. You know a lot of the um, uh, so the interesting thing is a lot of the students that ca that go to Columbus City Schools or schools around the area were actually born in Nepal in the refugee camp. So when they say you know so where are you from? They say I am from Nepal. And then I say are you really from Nepal? You know like so you know this is just don't forget your you know your history where your parents come from. Um, Practice what you're practicing. Do not let other people influence you or, you know, like change your ways. Rather try to educate them, you know. Um, and, and, you know, th that is very important distinction that, you know, you have to make as a person. And, uh, you know, for me, being a Bhutanese American is, uh, I'm, actu I'm actually a U.S. citizen since I came as a refugee. We have, uh, we get a green card in a year and then after four years, after you've gotten your green card, you can take the test and, you know, you pass that test and you get your citizenship. So I'm, I'm very proud that I'm a U.S. citizen now, you know. But again, I don't take that for granted, you know, because I, I was a person without an identity for so long. You know, I did not belong to any, any country. Although my, I mean, parents were Bhutanese, they had their citizenship, but that did not help them to stay there, right? So always represent no matter, you know, where you go. Um, and uh, definitely, I like to think of the ab about the people, you know, that cannot uh, speak for themselves or their people. So when I try to uh, go to places like this, and when I try to talk to people about my past experiences, I always keep th keep that in mind that I'm speaking for other people. You know, a lot of the people that whose voices are not going to be heard. You know, and there are many um, many reasons for that. So. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to keep going and going and going because I'm. I don't know about you, but I'm very moved by the, all the comments you guys made. And thank you so much for your input. Um, so, as a forum, this is the end of the forum. But uh, uh, those who came from uh, Allegheny, Kenyan, and also the, all those panelists and guests and their friends, uh, we are generous. We, we're going to invite you um, to the the dinner. At, to be held at the Hachman Hall across the, the quad at the, uh, din for dinner. Um, so thank you so much for coming and staying at the end of the forum. And again, uh, one more applause for the, all the panelists who contributed. <laughs>